Welcome to our podcast. My name is Keely Severson, and I'm here with my co-host Eric Johnson and Alicia Swami, and we are Exposing Mold. Today we are here with Jessica and Dakota, and they are from C4 Laboratories, which is, why don't you tell us about C4 Laboratories? C4 Laboratories is a cannabis testing laboratory based in Scottsdale, Arizona. We test everything um, that the Arizona Department of Health Services requires for compliant testing. Um, and then we also do R&D testing for private growers as well. Um, like I said, we're fully compliant and fully in-house um, testing services uh, for all of Arizona and then hemp from um, anywhere in the United States. Thank you for explaining that. I think the topic of testing hemp and cannabis products for mold contaminants is so important, especially to our audience, because th these medicines have such neuroprotective effects and they help with oxidative stress, which is some of the presentation we see in our sick population. And also our population can have symptom flares from having contaminated CBD. There's some times where people will say, I took such and such hemp and CBD and it flared my lupus. Well, we see lupus presentations all the time as a presentation of mold illness. So it's like people don't even realize how many different health symptoms they can have that could be related to their contaminated medicines that they're trying to use. Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this industry? Yeah, mine is a unique story um, in that my daughter has uh, disabilities. She is 18 now, and when she was about nine years old, her um, seizures were pretty bad. She was having about four to seven seizures a day, and I wanted to look into alternative um, treatments for her, and her doctor was more interested in looking into brain surgery. And that's something my husband and I were not um, not up for at that point. And uh, I had some friends talk to us about the possible benefits of CBD. So I started doing my own research. Um, I found an amazing documentary on CNN called Weed by Sanjay Gupta um, that sold me. I found a local mom on the news who was treating her son with uh, CBD and reached out to her and through a series of events was able to um, meet up with the right people and get the right products and saw immediate um, benefit to Emma. And because of the um, progress she was making with her seizures, I decided I needed to really help educate other parents about um, the benefits of CBD in treating epilepsy. And from that, I helped start a nonprofit organization to help educate those other parents and to help raise money for the costs because it's so expensive. Um, and that um, nonprofit kind of morphed into a position with a larger dispensary group um, in the outreach and education department where I got to still do the same thing, teach and educate patients of all kinds. Um, and from that, I moved in over to C4 Laboratories as the um, client outreach um, and educator and um, from there moved into manager and then director of operations so it's been a journey and it's been um, an amazing journey one that i am eternally grateful for i always think it's so beautiful when somebody can take something that life has thrown at them and and turn it into to something that helps other people like you're doing with with your daughter's illness and yeah. and thank you thank you for sharing that Dakota tell, talk to us a little bit about your role and and what you do with C4 Great. Laboratories. yeah um you know it's a little difficult to follow what Jessica just <laughs> just mentioned but um you know I recently graduated uh probably about five years ago now and um you know kind of emphasizing on what you were talking about with uh potential contaminations and molds affecting people with um things they already have, uh, it really interested me. I know that cannabis in Arizona alone has recently been legalized. So that gave us the opportunity to start R&D and start figuring out all these issues that not a lot of the country could even start to do until the last few years. So uh, that's kind of my passion, being able to help people um, with the industry and making sure that everyone's getting clean uh, medicine that they can use to help them benefit their symptoms. And that's really been my passion with the company. Uh, I'm currently the project manager but I started over as a lab technician. Um, I worked in the microbiology department to get us accredited for 
uh, aspergillus contamination, E. coli, and salmonella. Um, I dabble a little bit in the analytical side with residual solvents and helping with pesticides to make sure that everyone's getting clean and safe cannabis and CBD in the state of Arizona. How often are you coming across contaminated cannabis? Like, is it is it a very frequent occurrence? And can you tell us what brands we can trust more <laughs> or which ones to stay away from? Well, unfortunately, I can't tell you what brands we can trust more. But, um, you know, roughly uh, towards the beginning, when we first started testing, there was a lot of contamination with um, most samples, truly. Uh, we could start with the microbial contamination, uh, aspergillus in Arizona, we detect or test for four different strains. Um, towards the beginning, we did see a lot because the cultivators were still, they weren't that um, knowledgeable or familiar with a lot of these molds. Um, and luckily, you know, they've been able to remediate a little bit more and, um, work on fixing their problems with aspergillus to start. Um, that was probably, I'd say in our laboratory, one of the most um, frequent things that we found in samples uh, around the entire, I'd all say of all of the analyses in our laboratory. Um, I think it's safe to say aspergillus, um, just because of the climate that we live in is a little more um, frequent <laughs> than maybe some other climates. I mean, we're so dry and dusty and arid and um so it's it's not surprising is that the only mold that's tested for in the products or are there other molds looked for um specifically in arizona um to my knowledge just aspergillus uh four different strains and it is a pass fail so we use a pcr if it is detected it's immediately uh they have a few options they can either remediate it if it's a flower or um destroy it how are those standards standards set for your industry to say like, okay, this is how we're going to decide what to look for? Do you have information? I think on that? Um, really when Arizona was looking at the rules for regulating um, cannabis testing, they looked to other states that have already done it. Um, I believe we took a lot of our um, like pass fail levels from the Oregon standards that they have. Um, and uh, they also looked at California and Colorado to see what they were doing. And I think they, um, they really just kind of looked at those states that had done it before us. Well, it's nice to hear now that growers are maybe a little bit more accustomed with, or maybe mm -hmm. more familiar with how to grow, that they're preventing maybe mold growing on their plants. So at least there's a learning curve For there. Sure. Alicia, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Um, this was really exciting for us. I don't know why out of the blue, I was just like, let's get some people on and talk about mold and cannabis because I am seeing an explosion of articles constantly in the news of um, contamination of these plants um, in Colorado and just New Mexico and just everywhere. Um, and I'm just curious is what is the most popular contaminant that you guys are finding? Is it simply mold or is it pesticides? Is it other things? What, what is it that you're finding most of in these plants? Uh, we are still finding um, aspergillus, but like Dakota said, you know, we, um, people are now kind of getting the, um, getting the system down. They are, they're understanding what it takes to, um, to make sure that they're, their plants are free from that contaminant. Um, pesticides are another one that we're finding a lot of. Um, and what is interesting is that, you know, people might test flour with us and there might be pesticides in that flour, but it's not enough to, for us to fail them. It hasn't reached that limit. However, if they take that same flour and they make a concentrate, um, what it seems like the, the disconnect is that, well, when you're concentrating a flour and making it a concentrate, everything is concentrated from the cannabinoids to any of the contaminants that they found. So while the pesticides in that flower may have passed, once you make that into a concentrate, the pesticide levels are gonna be concentrated and that's higher and probably fail. Wow, so what are, um, what are companies doing to basically mitigate these issues? I mean, because crop loss means profit loss. So um, I'm sure they've come up with new ideas on how to control all these issues. Um, you know, we don't have exactly um, 
the Dr techniques. Dr techniques or anything yeah. to give them. We, we don't have any say. Um, we could say, hey, we uh, we tested your sample. Um, it came back with uh, positive for aspergillus. Um, and we give them that. That's all we can do on our side. Uh, we don't have any jurisdiction to, we could give them recommendations and we try to, you know, we're willing to go out to environmental tests and help them find their solutions. Uh, but realistically, it's still up in their hands to. Uh, there are ways to remediate sometimes, um, but yeah, sometimes it is just a profit loss. Um, I, Dakota, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if there is mold found in flour, can they remediate, make it into a concentrate and eradicate that mold? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so there are options depending upon what the flour or what the product is and then what the contaminant is. Okay. Um, one thing that I think is really um, interesting um, is that uh, while we're testing these products and you know, we have some clients that continue to um, pop for say aspergillus, um, one service that we do offer is going into their grow facility, their production facility and doing environmental testing. And that includes surface testing, air samples, um, and just kind of like the nooks and crannies of their production facility. And a lot of times it's in like the air vents or the surfaces that they're not even thinking about. They, they might be cleaning with like say, um, just regular um, rubbing alcohol, but that's not strong enough to kill some of these spores. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, so it's been really enlightening to us and then to the clients as well to be able to go into their facility and help them kind of pinpoint where the source is. Wow, so how often are you seeing contamination from building versus just plants being contaminated? that's hard to say because we don't have all of our clients utilizing these, these services and doing the environmental testing that we hoped they would. Um, it's something that we offer to everyone, but ultimately it's up to them. Um, it's unfortunate. Sometimes I think some um, growers want to stick their head in the sand and say, no, it's not me. It's, it's not us. It's not our facility. It's just what was in the flower. Um, and uh that's unfortunate. We, we just continue to educate others in hopes that they will um, really take into account what we're saying and trust our, our um, experience um, with the situation and utilize these services. Thank you. I'm just really curious because I know some states have different laws where you can only grow indoors. I think Nevada is indoor only. Um, I, I know Oregon has a little bit more leniency where you can grow outdoors. I'm just really curious. I don't know if you know this, but I wanted to throw this question out there. Um, are you seeing contamination more from plants being grown indoors versus naturally outdoors? Well, in Arizona, you know, we're obviously a very hot um, and arid climate. Um, so growing outdoors doesn't happen often. We do have outdoor grows. It is allowed. Um, it's up north of us and it's only, I think maybe two times in the year that really they have windows for growing opportunities. Um, when we get the flower, we don't, we don't um, do anything different if it's door, done outdoor, if it's grown outdoor rather um, versus indoor. In fact, most of the time we don't even know. Um, so it's hard to say, um, but I would say probably 80 or 90% of the flower that's grown in Arizona is indoor. But outdoor, I could definitely see more potential contamination, especially with um, aspergillus. Yeah, I wonder, I, because valley fever is such a big problem in Arizona, I wonder if like even that can contaminate the plants and, and cause issues. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'm just dreaming things up here. Um, please forgive me if I'm if I may have missed this earlier in your guys' conversation with Keely, but um, so you guys are only focusing on as pen right now in your PCR testing, or do you test for other species as well? Um, are in, in terms of aspergillus? Yeah. So in terms of your testing methodology, you're doing a PCR of aspen. Is it, are you only culturing for aspen or looking for aspen or do you have like a whole PCR list of maybe 30, 35 species that you're looking at for contamination in these crops? So uh, specifically for aspergillus, we're looking for four different species. Um, just to name two off my head, Fumigatus, Flavus. Um, and then another step we can kind of discuss afterwards is 
and including uh, just aspergillus testing, we do mycotoxin testing uh, to detect for aflatoxin, ochratoxin um, byproducts of these aspergillus per se. Um, and then we do additional salmonella testing, E. coli testing, uh, just like any other food. So like bacterial uh, testing and everything. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. Um, and so when you say that, you know, this farmer's had a bad batch, um, I mean, do you ever hear anything from the consumer side or is anyone calling you and saying, look, I, <laughs> I had a reaction. I want to send this for testing because I think this is contaminated and, and this farmer may have harmed me. Are you seeing a, a rise of that happening these days? Not as much as um, we had in the beginning. We definitely did. We'd have clients call us and say, this is like hurting my throat. I, I've never felt like this when I've tried this flower before. I know it passed. However, I want to check for myself. And so uh, we definitely do. Um, like I said, we do R&D. So that would be kind of falling under the R&D uh, umbrella of uh, private consumers wanting to test their medicine. Um, and so we have seen an uptick in that. It's kind of leveled off now because um, I feel like cultivators, uh, brands, growers, they are taking the rules seriously and actually making sure that everything is passing. And um, so it's, it's tapered off, fortunately. Well, that's good. I mean, the whole industry is fairly new, right? Legalizing it and, and processing all this stuff. And so everyone's trying to work out the kinks and figure out how do we do this? What's the best way? And how can we produce the most highest uh, quality product, right? Yeah, the crazy thing is, is that Arizona, we've had a medical market since 2010. Um, and, um, but we just started, um, we just passed the bill for um, for testing, mandatory testing in 2020. So we were like 10 years, like literally the wild, wild west, like learning all these bad habits. And now all of a sudden, all you know, these brands, they have to do these tests. They have to provide the COAs and everything. And um, yeah, it was messy. It was really messy in the beginning, but I feel like we finally kind of found our groove. Um, everyone is um, understanding of what is expected of them. And for the most part, you know, abiding by the rules. That's awesome. And since you brought up um, medical cannabis, I'm just curious, are there differences in quality between the two? Is like medical cannabis, like, testing is more stringent like is there a whole other different process versus recreational yeah you want yeah to yeah um cannabis you know medicinal and recreational they do have different um regulations for example um so silly <laughs> we test aspergillus for medicinal cannabis but aspergillus is actually not required by recreational in the state of arizona and that's that that's a big one um yeah that that's probably the biggest one and it, it makes zero sense at whatsoever the good news is that we find that um all of our clients really they just test for metal for the medical side because if you test your products for the medical side that can still be sold on the recreational side however if you are testing the recreational products you can't sell recreational products to a medical patient. So they're, they're doing their due diligence and just getting it medically tested so they can sell to both without having any concern. So it's fortunate in that way. It's unfortunate that it was written that way because it just, it makes zero sense, especially with like aspergillus. Like why wouldn't you have that uh, mandated for, for every kind of testing? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're akin to, and we're very curious of molds like uh, the trichothecene producers like Fusarium and Stachy. And uh, I mean, uh, Keely, Eric, and I have been severely injured by Stachybotrys in our homes. And so I'm just wondering how often um, those type of molds are found in crops. Unfortunately, because Arizona doesn't mandate like those specific strains, we don't know specifically. Yeah, we, we, our micro team is great at what we do, but um, outside of, you know, those, those other uh, strains that you mentioned, yeah. we don't have too much knowledge on it. Yeah, I'm curious. So if you guys are going, so you're, so you're offering a few arms here, you're offering uh, testing for plants, but you're also offering testing for environment. 
So, and those tests are varying. And, I, and I'm assuming you are actually including those trigodesine producers in your environmental testing, correct or no? Um, realistically, when, when a client comes to us, you know, they're asking us, why do we have this aspergillus problem? Why, why are you failing our samples, basically? Um, we say, hey, listen, you know, we're detecting aspergillus here. We're more than willing to come out to your facility and do some environmental testing, specifically looking just for aspergillus in this case. Um, if they ask for it, we would most definitely be able to um, in our facilities. But for example, we would, um, you know, do swabs in specific places, air samples, and um, kind of figure out where that source is coming from. Uh, I personally have been on site at cultivation and, uh, you know, done some air sampling and testing and found out that there was aspergillus in one of the corners growing um, in their facility. And the flower wasn't actually testing uh, presumptive positive itself, but it was uh, concentrates. And it was from after it was grown because it was grown clean, but the aspergillus was finding its way onto the sample afterwards because we don't, we don't know how long they actually hold onto that flower, how long it sits in the dark, how long it's just, it's just there before they even test it or sell it to anyone. Yeah, it's just so interesting because, you know, mold, our co-host Eric, who's been in the mold game for 35 years, he'll always say that, you know, mold in buildings, it's like unheard of and making people sick. And all of a sudden it's like we have this explosion. And I guess what a lot of people don't make that, make the connection to is like a lot of people are getting injured by mold in their homes. Well, what about what's going on in industry? <laughs> like, um, I know a person who knows a person who works for a vaccine maker's factory and they're having major microbial issues and they're having a major hard time trying to control the micro microbial issues within the vials themselves while they're producing these vaccines. So it's just like, man, it, it, it's not just a home thing. It is a business thing. And business are also, they're also having a really hard time controlling this problem that has just exploded within the last 30 years. And I'm just curious, and, and Dakota, I don't know how long you've been in this game of testing, but in your experience, are you noticing just an increase of, of um, I guess, Aspen or, or mold issues? Um, it's been pretty steady, um, you know, especially in Arizona, we have all four biomes. So we're seeing every single thing possible when it comes to uh, temperatures, times of day, anything you can think of. Um, it's been pretty steady, but it has been, I'd say, in my opinion and, 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 and knowledge and working at this company, it's been pretty elevated for mold in particular. Um, that's like, you know, like we emphasized on before, that's one of the biggest things that clients fail when they test their samples with us. I have a question. If there was a company who wanted to test their products above and beyond what the current requirements are, is that something that you could work out with them? Like if we had a CBD that we wanted to test, but we wanted to look for other molds just for our own peace of mind and go above and beyond the requirement, is that, do you have like the the equipment to help us with that? Yeah, so, you know, our vision at C4 is, you know, we're, we are under the assumption that eventually, you know, this is going to be federally legal. The testing and everything will be more um, strict. So we are always ready for stuff like that. And that includes, you know, we do do a lot of R&D. If a client comes to us with any issue, we want to help them solve it. Um, if they want more molds, we're definitely going to be able to do that for them. Uh, R&D, internal validation, you know, we're willing to work, we're willing to learn, we want to help people and we want to make sure that we can do everything that they need to know so that they can get their safe product to people. Yeah, practically speaking, it does take a little bit of time and extra money. Um, it doesn't mean that we certainly wouldn't do it. Of course, we'll look into it, but it does require uh, things that uh, it's, it's just not... You, can't just swab something and, and look for a new strain of mold, um, but it's definitely something that we can talk to the client about, research, look into, see how much uh, time and money it would take to, um, to uh, test for a different kind of mold than what we already test for. But it's definitely, we're always open to discussion on that. So it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us both today. I don't have any more questions. Um, Alicia, 
Yeah. Would you like to do our closing? Yeah. Um, I, I'm done with questioning, but um, if any, I guess if anyone listening today, any, I mean, we have such a varied audience. It's like professionals to, to patients, to just everyone. If anyone wanted to consult with your company, where can they reach out to you? Absolutely. You can find us on the internet, www.c4lab.com. That is the letter C, the number four, L-A-B, as in boy, dot com. Um, so you can find out a lot of information there. You can always uh, reach out to us on the phone, 480-219-6460. And alternatively, you can email myself or Dakota, uh, Jessica, at c4laboratories.com and Dakota at c4laboratories.com. Fantastic. Thank you guys. We're, we're interested in um, learning more from a grower too. I don't know if you can make any recommendations or, or anything like that, but um, we'd be really open to maybe getting into the nitty gritty of growing and, and what they're doing to control their contamination. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a great conversation with Jessica and Dakota. Dakota. We were learning a little bit more about cannabis testing. Um, and we reached out basically because we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on with all this contamination everywhere. So they really provided us some great information to see what the industry is doing to control that and to provide better quality products for their patients and for the recreational users. So thank you again, everyone. We'll see you next time.